And man, thank you to the band and the praise team for that wonderful time of worship this morning. Thank you for joining in with us today on what is our Resurrection Sunday. And Lord knows this is a different way to celebrate Easter because we're used to all of us being together in this sanctuary. But I'm happy to report to you that even though you may not be in the sanctuary today, you still have a reason to celebrate and that is that the tomb is empty. Jesus is alive and well today, praise the Lord. And we're so thankful for the payment that Christ made on the cross on our behalf. And it was your sin and it was my sin that he carried to that cross. And I'm sure like many of you, I've been watching as I've been quarantined this weekend, I've been watching some of those beautiful movies that portray uh, the the crucifixion of, of Christ and the life of Christ. And man, it just makes me so, so thankful that Jesus would love us when we were unlovable, that while we were still sinners, the Bible said that God demonstrated his love for us in this way, that he sent his only son to come and, and pay our debt and to pay that price for us this morning. But thank you for tuning in. This is our Easter celebration service, and I'm going to conclude this morning with you the sermon series that we started back several weeks ago asking the question, who is Jesus? Just who exactly is this man that we worship, this man that walked the earth, this man that has ascended now to the right hand of the Father making intercession for you and I, this third part of the triune Godhead? Who is Jesus? So we've been answering a few Questions over the past few weeks, questions like, is he the lion or is he the lamb? Is he a way or is he the way? Is he my friend or is he my foe? And is he just another good teacher? Is he just another good prophet? Is he just another good man or is he God? And remember Christianity, we set ourselves apart from every other World religion in our answer to that one single solitary question. And I want you to know this morning that we know he is the undeniable, irrefutable, undisputable son of the living God. If for no other reason than for this reason, that on the third day following his crucifixion, when the women went to anoint his body for burial, all they found was an empty tomb and some grave clothes because Jesus Christ had risen from the dead with complete victory over death, hell, and the grave. Hallelujah. Our text for this series has come from 1 Peter Chapter 3, verse number 15, that says, In your heart, revere Christ as Lord. And then Peter said, Be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you about the hope that you have. I want somebody to hear me this morning. You have hope today. I don't care how bleak your situation may seem. I don't care how challenging the storm may be. I don't care how many people have tried to tell you that you're not going to make it. I want you to know because the tomb is empty this morning, you have hope in Jesus. And you ought to be able to shout it from the rooftop and tell everybody about it that asks you the reason why you have hope today in Christ Jesus our Lord. The question we want to look at this morning is, who is Jesus? Is he a king or is he a pawn? Is he a king that, that is in complete control, who has all control, or he, is he a pawn, rather, who is under the control of somebody else? When you think about the game of chess, there are a, a couple of of pieces, a few pieces in that particular game, two of those by which happen to be a king and a pawn. The king in the game of chess is the most important piece in the game. He is the piece, if you will, that really is in 
control of the game because everybody that's serving on that board, they are serving the king. They are trying to defend and protect the king. The king can go in any direction that he wants. He can go wherever, whenever he wants because he is the king. He is in control, if you will, of the game of chess. But then you've got another piece in the game of chess, and it is the pawn piece. He is the piece that you sacrifice at the expense of the king. He, he's very limited in the directions that he can go. He can only go forward occasionally. He can go diagonal, but he's very limited because he's not in complete control. Everything the pawn does is to serve and protect and defend the king. The game of chess is really all about control. You're thinking about the next move and and even the move beyond that, contemplating the end from the beginning. Matter of fact, chess masters will tell you that to win the game of chess, you have to be able to think 15 to 20 moves ahead. Somebody just grasp that. you got to think that far ahead and really be able to calculate what your end position will be before you ever get there. Can I just tell somebody, the game of chess is just a little bit beyond my ability. But I have found something out. There's a little man that lives in my phone. And every time I go to the game of chess in my phone and I attempt to play that game, the little man that lives in my phone that becomes my opponent, he is a lot smarter than I am. Because I think, you know, if I do this, then then he's going to do that. Or or if I do that, then, then he'll do this. But it never happens that way. All it takes is one misplaced move. All it takes is one move that I hadn't planned on, one move that I hadn't thought about, one move that I hadn't prepared for, and everything gets turned upside down. And isn't that just the way it is with life? As much as we think we can control life, we really cannot control anything beyond our next move because life happens. COVID-19 happens. Cancer happens. Funerals happen. Divorce happens. Foreclosures happen. Layoffs happen because life happens beyond our control. I remember when we were going to Africa on our mission trip back in, uh, in 2009 and we had a really good flight planned out. Man, our travel agent, she had done a, a superb job of booking us a flight from the Washington, D.C. airport. We flew straight to London, England. And then we had a direct flight from London, England to Nairobi, Kenya. It was a, it was a great, masterful flight. Except there was one detail that she kind of looked over. And that was this, that in London, England, we only had about an hour, a 60-minute layover. And she assured us that we would have plenty of time. We could get to that next terminal and get on that next plane that would take us on that that breeze of a flight directly to Nairobi, Kenya. But I'm just going to guess that our travel agent had never been to the London International Airport because it is gigantic. It is a huge, masterful airport. Matter of fact, when we when we the plane landed there at the airport, we actually had to be taxi. You remember that, Pastor Joni? We had to get off that plane onto a little taxi, and then that little taxi, that little van, drove us to the airport. And then from the airport, we had to get to our next terminal, had to get on another taxi and be taxi back out to the next plane. I knew getting off that plane that barring a miracle from the Lord, there was no way that we were going to make that next flight. But we tried. We did everything in our power. We did everything under our control. We we rushed through uh, the security checkpoints. We ran through uh, the terminals, man, trying to, to get to that, that next place. And, and poor Sister Donna, she got in such a hurry. I know she knows the story I'm about to tell. She got in such a hurry trying to get through that airport that she got to this escalator and she got one foot on the bottom step of the escalator and her other foot got hung up behind one of her bags. And I don't know if you've ever seen that movie Elf where he does a split 
on the escalator, but that's what it looked like. Bless her heart. We got her, finally got her to Africa. She about had to be put in traction because of all the muscles she pulled on the escalator that day. But we did everything that we could, didn't we, Sister Donna? Trying to make that next flight. But guess what? It was all in vain. We got there with 20 minutes to spare. But the taxi had already left from the airport, or the terminal, and was already gone out to the plane with the people. And we begged them to please, the plane is right there. Would, could you please? No, no. Once the taxi's left, nobody else can board the plane. So that hour layover in London, England turned into a six hour layover in London, England. But that wasn't the worst of it. Now there's no longer a direct flight to Nairobi. Kenya. Now we have to fly to Dubai. Do you know where Dubai is? It is smack dab in the center of the Middle East, right next to Saudi Arabia. That was an experience. Then we spent a layover there, a couple of hours in Dubai, and finally we flew to Nairobi, Kenya. By the time we got there, we were all so exhausted from all these layovers and planes, and we go to pick up our luggage. And guess what? Marcus's luggage wasn't there. It was on one of the other planes that I had missed and gone halfway around the world. So I spent a couple of days anywhere, uh, anyway, wearing the same shirt and the same pants and the same, uh, you catch my drift. I'm sure they all did as well. Hallelujah. You know, it's just what happens. We had no control over the situation. And I thought, you know, when, when life begins to happen, That way to us, when life gets out of control, and I'm talking about stuff far beyond just a missed plane and some misplaced luggage. I'm talking about, man, life-altering situations and challenges. When, When life gets out of our control, it's easy for us to start asking the question, is God really in control? Is he the the king that he claims to be? Is he the king who is in complete control of this situation? Or is he really a pawn who is moved about by the circumstances that are around him? See, what we got to remember is this. There's a big picture to our life. We don't understand it all. We, We certainly can't. The Bible says we look through a glass dimly. Our ways are not his ways. Our thoughts are not his thoughts. But here's what he declared in Isaiah 46 and 10. He said, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times what is still to come. He said, I say that my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. What you and I have to remember is that when everything is seemingly spinning out of control, it is still spinning in the palm of his hand. What you and I have to remember is when the waves are seemingly crashing over our head, they are still crashing under his feet. What you and I have to remember is that God has promised to work in all things and through all things for the good of those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Do you notice the last two words in that scripture? His purpose. See, everything may not work out according to your plans and purposes, but they will work together for the Lord's purpose because the Bible says many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that will prevail. See, Pilate, when he was having uh, Jesus on trial, He asked Jesus a very defining question in John chapter 8, verses 33 through 37. It said, Pilate went back inside the palace and he summoned Jesus to ask him, Are you the king? You notice the question, Are you the one that's in full command and and control and authority? Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, is that your own idea or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied, it was your own people and your chief priests that handed you over to me. What is it that you have done? And Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, then my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. He said, but my kingdom... Is from another place. So you are a king then, said Pilate. And this is how Jesus answered. 
He said, you are right to say that I am a king. In fact, the reason that I was born, the reason I came into this world is to testify to the truth. And everyone who stands on the side of truth will listen to me. See, Pilate is really trying to answer the same question that that we are asking this morning. Is Jesus a king or is he a pawn? Well, let's talk first about a pawn. Because a pawn is someone who does not work according to their own will, according to their own purpose, but they're used to carry out the will and the purpose of other people. In John 19.10, Pilate said to Jesus, Do you not realize that I have the power to free you or to crucify you? Pilate is in essence saying you are no king. You're just a, a pawn in my kingdom because I have the power and the authority backed by the Roman Empire to do with you as I please. And There's nothing that you can do aside from my command to change that. But what was Jesus' reply back to Pilate? My mind, as I was reading this scripture, just goes back to our Easter drama that we would have been presenting this weekend. And I remember as we were practicing during those uh, nights of drama practice, Tommy would stand here on the stage with Pastor Timmy, and he would ask or say that, don't you realize I have the power, Timmy telling Tommy that I have the power to release you or to, to crucify you, and Tommy would look at him and repeat those words of Jesus, you have no power Over me, except it be given you by my Father, except it be given you from above. Jesus was really just saying this, Pilate, you have power because I say you can have power. Jesus is saying, Pilate, I'm the real king here. I'm the one that is in control. And what happened next, it proved it, right? Because an angel showed up, broke the chains off Jesus' hands and forced Pilate to bow down right then and there, and Jesus set up his earthly kingdom. Is that what happened? No, it's not what happened. Jesus said, you don't have no power except the power be given to you. And what happened? He was sentenced to death by an angry mob, by religious leaders, by a Roman governor. Pilate put him on trial had him beaten and flogged. The Bible records the soldiers twisted together this crown of thorns and they placed it on his head and they wrapped him in a scarlet robe and watch how they mocked him. Hail Jesus, the so-called King of the Jews. He's forced to carry his own cross all the way to Calvary where they crucified him between two thieves. And while he hung on the cross in agony, they mocked him again, saying, if you are a king, if you really are in control, if you are who you claim to be, then why don't you come off the cross and save yourself and save us too? But guess what? He didn't. He hung there, and he bled, and he died. And one last smack in his face. The inscription is above his head as he hung on the cross dying. Jesus, the King of the Jews. You know what they're letting folks know? This is what we do with so-called kings. Because we are really the ones in control. Rome has the power. Rome is king. The emperor is king. And this is what we do with so-called kings. They're used to carry out the will and the power of Rome. So was Jesus a king? What he claimed, you have no power over me, and yet they sentenced him to death. Was he a king or was he just a pawn that's moved about by the external influences of those around him, because a king and a pawn, they're, they're very opposite of each other. A pawn has to be carried about the will of somebody else, but a king, he exercises his will over everybody else. He uses everybody else to carry out his will and his plans and his purpose. So how could that be? Jesus is hanging on a cross at the will of, the other, of, of people, at the will of the governor, at the will of the emperor of Rome. How could it be that he could be the king? See, what they didn't realize is it wasn't the nails that was holding Jesus to the cross. 
It was the love of God that held him there. What they didn't realize was this was a purpose and a plan that went far beyond the scope of the right then and there. What they didn't realize, this was a plan and a purpose that was established since the beginning of time that Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the Bible says slain from the foundation of the world, he would become the propitiation, the payment for the sin of the whole world. When Peter pulled out his sword, if you remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, he went to fight the soldiers. Jesus said, Peter, Do you not realize I could ask my father for angels to protect me? And he would dispatch thousands and thousands from heaven. But how then would the scripture be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? Jesus is letting Peter know I'm in full control of what's going on in my life right now. My life's not being taken from me. I'm laying it down. And later Peter would stand up in front of a crowd of 3,000 recorded in Acts chapter 2 and say this man was handed over to you by God's prearranged plan by God's foreknowledge and you with the help of wicked men you put him to death by nailing him to the cross listen but God raised him from the dead and freed him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him somebody hear this preacher today death could not keep Jesus in its clutches any longer because his life was and taken he willingly laid it down and he said if I have the power to lay it down then I have the power to take it up again because Jesus barring a line from Kanye West Jesus isn't a pawn Jesus is king this morning hallelujah praise the Lord praise God I'm closing with this he's not just a king He is the king of all other kings. That means he is the supreme authority. That means that Jesus is the superior power. That means that he is above all and he is over all. John declared in John 3 and 31, he has come from above and he is greater than anybody else. Paul said in Ephesians 4, 6, he is God who is over all and through all and in all. David said in Psalms 103, 19, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Paul said again in 1 Chronicles 29 and 12, yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head of Above all, both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. And finally, Jesus said in Matthew 28 and 18, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. See, the religious leaders and the governmental powers of his time, they all asked Jesus the same question Are you a king? And they didn't like his answer, and they had him killed for it. But do you know what happened in 36 AD? Pontius Pilate died and he was buried and he stayed in the tomb where they placed his body. Do you know what happened in 37 AD? Tiberius, the emperor of Rome, died and he was buried, and he stayed in the tomb where they placed his body. Do you know what happened in 39 A.D.? Herod, the Roman appointed king of Judea, he died, and he was buried, and he stayed in the tomb where they placed his body. But do you know what happened? In approximately 33 A.D., Jesus was beaten beyond recognition. Jesus was crucified on an old rugged cross, and Jesus was was placed in a borrowed tomb but Jesus did not stay there because on the third day when the sun woke up the earth the caverns of the deep opened up as to give birth to a resurrected Savior with healing in his wings and now the host of children they can rise and sing Jesus Christ walked alive out of the tomb with all command and all power and all authority and I believe that someday soon this 
this old world is going to see him coming in the clouds with power and great glory. And the Bible said on his head there will be many crowns and he'll be dressed in a royal robe that's been dipped in blood. And he's going to have the name written on his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Is it any wonder that the psalmist said, lift up your head, O ye gates, be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory, he will come in. Who is this King of glory? He is the Lord, mighty in battle. He is the Lord who is mighty to save. He is the King of glory. Somebody ought to type a big amen right there. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. He is the living king, the king of kings. How do we know? Because on that third day, man, the tomb could not hold him. The grave could not keep him. He walked alive out of that tomb with all command, all power, and all authority. And church, soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. I've asked the band, the praise team, to sing a song with me this morning called The King is Coming. Would you worship with us this morning as we sing? I wonder how many of you this morning, perhaps watching this message, are prepared to meet the King. Are you ready if the Lord Jesus should come back today? And I believe that it could happen at any moment. The time is going to come when He will cease to be our Savior and He will be our judge. Are you ready to meet the King? Because soon and very soon, I believe, Lord Church, if you turn on the news and and you watch it day in and day out, it's just a reminder that today could be the day prophecies are being fulfilled all around us Jesus I believe is getting ready to come back no man knows the day or the hour the Bible says he'll come like a thief in the night are you ready to meet the king would you bow your heads and your hearts right where you are I believe the King is coming. And I want you to be prepared to meet the Lord today. If you don't know Him as your Savior, the Bible says that if we confess our sin, that He's just and faithful. And He will forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Bible says to those that believed in Him, He gave them the power the privilege, the right. If you'll just accept Him, you can be called a child of God today. Would you pray a simple prayer with me and invite Him to be the King of your life? That's simply what Christianity is. We surrender the control of our own lives to the one who's really in control. and That is Jesus Christ, the King of of kings. Would you invite him to sit on the throne of your heart and to be your Lord and invite him to be your Savior? I'm going to ask you right where you are, if everyone watching, would you just pray this prayer with me this morning? Would you say, Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. What I need, Lord, is your forgiveness. Would you come into my heart? Would you walk into my life? And would you be the king over me? I surrender to your lordship. I surrender to your kingship. I repent of my sins. And I ask you to wash me in the blood of Jesus. Thank you for the cross of Calvary. Because it was there, the Bible says, that you canceled the debt that stood against me. 
Help us, God, to live for you all the days of our life. We accept you as our Savior. And we confess you as our King. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Who is Jesus? He is the Lamb of God. Slain from the foundation of the world. The spotless Lamb that came and took our place. And He canceled the debt of sin that stood against us. It is this season of Easter that we remember His death on the cross of Calvary. It is this season that we celebrate, of course, His glorious resurrection. But can I tell you, you can't have Easter Sunday without Good Friday. He bore our sin. He took our place. He was beaten beyond recognition. Stripped and whipped and the lashes that they laid upon his body, it would have been enough for anyone. But even after that horrific beating, they forced him to carry the cross. And Peter said that was part of God's prearranged plan. God knew that man would fall. He knew that you and I would be imperfect and that we would need a sacrifice, an ultimate sacrifice, a forever sacrifice that was found in Jesus Christ that in the book of Hebrews says, once and for all separated us from our sins. Now they're cast into the sea of forgetfulness and He does not remember your sins against you any longer. Man, that'd be a good place for somebody to lift your hands and say, thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for the cross of Calvary. We thank you, Lord, that you so loved us, God, when we were unlovable. We thank you, Lord, that you bore our sin, that you took our place. God, it was my cross, Lord, that you carried to Calvary. The old song says that when you were on the cross, Lord, I was on your mind. Thank you, God, for amazing grace. Thank you, Lord, for a love that knows no bounds, a love that we can never be separated from. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. We bless your name, Jesus. We worship you. We praise you this morning. I'm going to invite you right now where you are. Pastor Joni, would you come and help us pass out these communion elements to the folks that are here with us? In our sanctuary today, I'm going to ask you right where you are, would you gather your family together and would you get those communion elements together and we'll be back in just a moment and we're going to prepare our hearts to receive from the table of the Lord. God bless you. We think about the last time that Jesus partook of this meal, this holy meal. When he broke the bread with his disciples, and he passed the cup to his disciples, and he said, this is a new covenant that I am making with you. And he said, as often as you eat this bread, as often as you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. Until he comes. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 27, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. So we understand that this is a believer's communion. This is a meal that Christians only are to partake of as we remember the sacrifice that Christ made as His body was broken on the cross in our place, as His blood was shed for the remission of sin. Paul said, but let a man examine himself and then let him eat of the bread and let him drink of the cup. Verse 26 says, for as often as you eat this bread, 
as often as you drink this cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. Would you take just a moment right where you are? Just I want you to close your eyes. And in your own words, from your heart, I just want you to thank Jesus for the sacrifice that he made for you on the cross of Calvary. Lord, we praise you. God, we thank you. Words, God, would never quite be enough to say all that is in our heart to say. Thank you for the cross, Lord. It was there, God. It was at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light. And the burden of my sin was rolled away. It was there by faith, Lord, I received my sight. And now, God, we are happy all the day. We thank you, Lord, for your payment on our behalf. We thank you, Lord, that your body was broken for us, Lord. We thank you that in you we have the forgiveness of our sins through your blood, the writer said. We thank you for the blood of Jesus that was poured out, God, on my behalf. We worship you, God. We praise you. We thank you, Lord. If you would take your bread where you are with us this morning. Verse 23 of chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. Would you break or tear off that piece of bread where you are? And he said, take, eat, for this is my body, which is broken for you. And do this in remembrance of me. Would you take the bread now? Bless your name, God. Would you take your drink this afternoon right where you are? In the same manner, he also took the cup. And after supper, he said, this cup is the new covenant. It's a covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Would you take the cup now and remember his blood that was shed? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your body. Thank you, Lord, for the blood, God. We remember you this morning. We remember, Lord, the cross. God, the cross is the central part, foundation of our Christianity, Lord, of our faith, of our heritage. It's in the cross, Lord. Whatever we have need of, God, it can be found at the cross. It was there, Lord, that we were saved. It was there, God, that we were healed. It was there, God, that we were delivered. It was there, God, that the chain of sin was forever broken off of our life. We thank you, Lord, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We worship you today. I bless our church family, God, that just partook of this meal with us, proclaimed your death, remembered your sacrifice on the cross. Lord, I ask you to bless them to meet every need, Lord, in their lives, God, in their home, in their children, in their marriages. Lord, we we come against this COVID-19, Lord, the same blood that that saves is the same blood that heals. God, let that blood, I pray, go forth in power. Let it bring healing, God, to every home, every life that's been affected. Lord, may this disease be stopped, we pray, in the mighty name of Jesus. We worship you and we praise you today. Amen.